Welcome to Patients at Risk, a discussion of the dangers that patients face when physicians are replaced with non-physician practitioners. I'm your host and the co-author of the book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare, Dr. Rebecca Bernard. In January 2022, the Journal of Nursing Regulation published an article entitled Analysis of Nurse Practitioners' Educational Preparation, Credentialing, and Scope of Practice in U.S. Emergency Departments. The summary was really interesting. It said, due to the variability in educational preparation, nurse practitioners should not perform independent, unsupervised care in the emergency department, regardless of state law or hospital regulations. Now, this unequivocal statement contradicts the rhetoric from nurse practitioner leadership, which insists that nurse practitioners should be allowed to practice virtually anywhere and everywhere without supervision. So today I'm joined by family physician Christopher Garofalo and radiologist and PPP board member Phil Schaefer to discuss this important paper. Dr. Garofalo and Dr. Schaefer, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Bernard, for inviting me onto the show. This is a pleasure. This is authored by nurse practitioners and others in the nursing profession. Uh, For a long time now, there have been back and forths between physician and mid-levels about, you know, what does the literature say about being able to provide safe care? And there usually are accusations of bias against physicians. Um, But this one, hard to say there's accusations of bias when this is written by the nursing profession themselves. This topic, I know, is talked about amongst a lot of nurse practitioners. I see that on social media. And there are a lot of people which who agree with the authors of this, and we'll talk about the authors as Lavin et al. She's the first author, Uh, but um, it's rare to see it in print. And uh, the reason is that uh, as we have seen, as soon as someone says the emperor has no clothes, uh, there is a cascade of people with all sorts of letters behind their names uh, trying to say that, no, the sun does rise in the West, really. And um, I think the one truth they get at, uh, and I think listeners uh, need to understand this, is that um, the MPs have a requirement for only four, 500 hours of training. Uh, and they uh, constantly uh, want to tell people that their uh, care is equivalent to and or better than physicians who do 15,000 hours. And this makes no sense whatever uh, in any uh, human endeavor. I mean, I was better after three years than I was at six months. And I think anybody, regardless of what their uh, occupation is, can understand this. Yet, they push this message in legislatures and they get it uh, somehow accepted. The Lavin paper, uh, stands apart saying, no, actually, if you don't do the training, you don't know the stuff, which is entirely unsurprising. Uh, but uh, they are being um, run over the coals for this. And I've spoken to uh, Dr. Lavin, and she's, uh, she's well able to take this criticism. <laughs> she yeah. understood it was coming. She was ready for it. And her paper was very well written. And it's really hard to uh, criticize Yeah, it's an amazing paper. And I just want to give our listeners a little bit of background regarding uh, what you've mentioned and I mentioned some of the rhetoric that we hear from nurse practitioner leadership. And Dr. Garofalo referenced, both of you referenced the legislative efforts that have been made. And so back in 2020, the American Academy of Emergency Medicine, along with a few other groups, published a joint statement regarding the use of nurse practitioners and physician assistants in the emergency room. And they said, physicians must lead the care team in the emergency department, and they called on institutions to avoid compromising or diluting the training of emergency doctors, because we're seeing all of these sort of on-the-job training programs that they sometimes call fellowships, Um, and so there was a lot of concern about that. So very quickly, the uh, Emergency Nurses Association, American Academy of Nurse Practitioners, and uh, the Acute Care Nurse Practitioners, and the Acute Pediatric Care Nurse Practitioners published their own joint statement. And what they wrote was so fascinating. They said, our national organizations strongly oppose the view that emergency care is solely physician-led, in quotes, 
or that physicians should dictate education and practice standards for advanced practice nurses. They go on to say their usual mantra that nurse practitioners undertake rigorous preparation through their education and clinical training. They're accredited, they pass board exams. So here we go with that. We can do it and we don't need doctors and we can be in the emergency department. And that was in 2020. And so that's one of the reasons this paper is so important because they actually call and reference this, uh, this publication and Lavin et al. say that they support the American Academy of Emergency Medicine's position paper, and they specifically reference this. So the paper points out that there are about 14,800 uh, nurse practitioners working in emergency rooms. It also points out that only 10% of these, or about 1,500, are actually hold uh, certification as they give it uh, for emergency nurse practitioners. And it's called ENP, emergency nurse practitioners. Um, these 10% um, actually can qualify to take the examination by one of three routes. You can go to a, um, through a route that is basically on the job training, or you can do a hundred hours of CME, which means basically going to some meetings and reading some papers, or you can go to a training uh, uh, program. Only about 10% of these 1,500 went to any sort of training program. And the training programs, like all of their programs, are unsupervised. Uh, there are no criteria. There's no uh, curriculum. It's just whatever the um, uh, institution says it, they want it to be. And it's of whatever length. It doesn't need to be a year. It doesn't need to be half a year. It's whatever they think. And one institution stands out, and we're going to call them out, Samford University. They, this is in uh, Lavin's paper. She has a table that describes the uh, educational requirements for these programs. Samford University will take a person coming in as an RN, and in their program, give them both a, an NP and an EMP. Now, when they're going uh, doing the work to do the NP degree, it takes 500 hours, uh, clinical hours to do the NP degree. And then you can get the EMP designation with 40 more hours. Basically, you know, one week or less of work in an ER clinically, and you are now qualified to be an EMP. And for a physician, this is totally insane. One of the things in the paper too that they talked about was there's a lot of nurse practitioners who will say, well, you know, I worked in the intensive care unit for five years and my nursing experience counts. And while although there are some nurse practitioners who may at this current stage have actually done that experience, many nurse practitioners come right out of school. And when you actually look at what these programs require, some of them may require a year of being an RN, um, some of them may require a little bit of emergency experience, but I think the general message is that there is no standardization. And in fact, many of these programs, you can enter that without any formal nursing background. So they aren't even really experienced in nursing background before they move on to their NP part. So getting into the, the um, study itself, one of the things I thought was interesting was that they started it by giving a background and they said the thing that we always hear in response to physician shortages, economic pressures to contain costs, which I think is actually the bigger issue, especially now that we know that supposedly there's an oversupply of emergency physicians and evolving hospital policies that appreciate the skills and quality of care that nurse practitioners provide, U.S. emergency departments employ approximately 16,000 nurse practitioners. Recognizing that the outcomes of patient care are impacted by providers, educational preparation and training, licensure and certification, and scope of practice, it is critical that all these facets are aligned for nurse practitioners who are employed in the emergency room. So they made a very good case as to why this is important. And I think pointing out this corporate meta or these contract management groups. Um, I'm going to show some slides where you see Envision Healthcare. Um, they did a lecture where they 
uh, actually said that one of their strategic plans is to, quote, employ the least expensive resource to accomplish the mission. And they say in the emergency department, up to 25 to 35 percent of cases can be, quote, effectively and successfully seen independently by non-physician practitioners. So we know that they're being used in this capacity, and this is why Lavin and, and her colleagues wanted to study whether or not nurse practitioners are qualified. It's, it's very clear from this article, they are unequivocal in how they write this. They say this in the summary, Using nurse practitioners in the emergency department is, number one, not consistent with the consensus model that nurse practitioners themselves are supposed to follow. Only 10% of nurse practitioners working in the ER even have some type of formal emergency care training before they start. And even that is what she calls haphazard. Well, I'd like to take off a bit on what you just said and make sure the listeners understand something clearly. When they talk about being cost effective, a lot of people will think, oh, it's going to cost me less. No, it doesn't. They charge you the same and the cost effectiveness comes to the employer. Furthermore, the um, um, corporate group that you quoted was saying 25 to 35%. And that does not uh, seem to be in, uh, doesn't seem to be what's really happening. There are a lot of emergency rooms where there may be 10% of the care seen by physician or, and a lot of them now, 0%. Uh, some ERs are staffed entirely by MPs or PAs to some extent. What I learned from reading this paper is that you have to have a family nurse practitioner, like it, the emergency is built on family because family is across the lifespan. That's why, because supposedly they're supposed to be able to take care of newborns to geriatrics, which as a family doctor, the idea of training for that and learning how to do that in two years with 500 clinical hours is blows my mind. And it's fr- quite insulting. What do you think, Chris? You're a family doctor too. I agree 100%. Um, I think also if you take into account that if you look at some of the schools that are on that list, some of those schools are completely online. Uh, Also, some of these schools um, make the NPs find their own preceptors, which has become increasingly difficult. And that makes their actual clinical hours, of which the clinical hours already vary in terms of what they need, the quality of those clinical hours can vary significantly uh, based upon uh, who's being seen um, and where exactly you're getting that experience from. And that's not necessarily uh, a precept that's a physician. That can now be a nurse practitioner. Wow, that's a good point. So ultimately, the summary is saying this is uh, not a good situation. The lack of standardization, even among the most educated uh, emergency nurse practitioners, is, quote, extremely problematic, according to this paper. And the ASAP statement in 2020 saying that, stating that nurse practitioners should not perform independent, unsupervised care in the ED, regardless of state law, is supported by this study. And in fact, they go on to say that regulatory reform is needed to standardize these issues nurse practitioners should not provide unsupervised care and that reforms should be undertaken urgently. Now, Phil, you've mentioned the the term, the emperor has no clothes. Elaborate on what that means in this circumstance. Nursing uh, establishment, if I will, is fond of just making broad statements uh, like, oh yes, we're qualified. Like the statement you read from the AMP. And um, Lavin just went down and said, wait a second, let's look at this. Let's look at it critically. And I congratulate her because she has patients' uh, welfare at, in, in uh, mind here. Uh, but she looked at it very critically and found that the, um, the educational requirements are, are far less than they should be. And also, you know, we need to think about what is the minimum we should allow? Um, I personally think that the um, requirements set up by medicine as minimum requirements of, I think, three years of residency training uh, plus uh, prescribed a um, curriculum and uh, prescribed uh, testing to prove you've learned it is the minimum. And what happens when I go in 
expecting uh, someone to care for my life in an emergency system. And I get somebody who has had maybe 40 hours of clinical work in an ER. And I get somebody who has never had a tra any training about EKG. And I'm charged just as much. That is just not fair. One other aspect of this is people are pointing out that uh, a lot of these NPs are going to rural areas to supply rural ERs because there are places that um, uh, physicians sometimes don't want to work. And it's not, they don't want to work there. It's just that they feel more comfortable with all their support they have in, in or, urban. Or what we're seeing now is that employers just don't want to hire them. They're looking for, you know, the lowest cost warm body to bring in. Right. And so you wind up with a situation like we had in Oklahoma in that one hospital where there was an ER open so that they could uh, see patients and charge patients. And it was staffed by an NP who had uh, an FNP. She had no ER training and she had no idea what she was looking at, which would be evident to any third year medical student. And the patient died as a result. And uh, that's the, the people in small rural areas are getting second class substandard care. And there's a lot of discussion about social equity in medicine these days. And that stands out as a glaring example of how supplying substandard care really does harm certain people in certain areas. And uh, it sh should become part of the social equity discussion. So I would like to just finish one point that, Phil, I think you were just about to get to, which is that th this is almost a, a myth at this point that nurse practitioners and PAs go to places physicians do not want to go. Uh, the American Medical Association actually has a workforce map that you can actually go to and download, and it will show you, if you look at where NPs and PAs go and where physicians go, they pretty much overlap each other. So they, these patients are not necessarily getting care or getting any care uh, rather than just getting care from a physician. So, you know, it, it's sort of one of those legs that they make their argument on, but it doesn't really hold up. The other thing, and I've sort of begun to describe this a little bit to people. I know there's a lot of nurse practitioners who have been out there for a long time and practicing, and I think that's wonderful. And they like to talk about what their outcomes data are, <laughs> which you can go back and forth about. However, you know, I tell people it's sort of like if you think about building a house, you can make the house look beautiful on the inside, but if you don't have the foundation of the house that is going to be stable to hold up that beautiful home you built, that beautiful home is going to collapse. And I sort of make that analogy to the training that a lot of the nurse practitioners have. They don't have the underlying training. They just <laughs> they don't have the pathophysiology. They don't have differential diagnosis. They just don't have that training. So even if they can show that their care is equal to physicians, they still don't have that underlying training that really supports that. And I do want to make one other thing. I, we're often, physicians are often accused of sort of, you know, turf wars and, and bashing nurse practitioners. Most of us are actually very much in favor of having nurse practitioners and PAs taking care of patients. It's not about not having them there. It's about having them do what they are trained for and have them under the direction of a physician. And I think that's really important that we have to make sure that the listeners understand and our nurse practitioner PA colleagues to understand as well. And that's actually, Lobin actually says that in the article. I say, we have come a very far distance from the way the professions were originally designed and created. And, you know, it sounds like she's pointing out that we have gone astray and that we really, it's time to look at reining things back in to keep patients safe. Well, I want to thank both of you so much. We're out of time. I would love to keep talking about this issue. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, I encourage you to get the book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare. It's available at Amazon and at barnesandnoble.com. And if you're a physician and you'd like to learn more about advocating for physician-led care and truth and transparency among healthcare practitioners, 
please join our group, Physicians for Patient Protection. You can find us at our website, physiciansforpatientprotection.org. Thanks so much. We'll see you on the next podcast.